everyone! As so very many of you have suggested, I decided to go ahead and give Pink Floyd a try. And as announced a few days ago, it's going to be Hey You from the album entitled The Wall. As usual, in the first part, you will get to see my first listen to these pieces and my spontaneous reactions and thoughts. Now, I have to say this from the very beginning. I am going to pause the song along the way because the whole point of this first part is for me to share with you what my thoughts and feelings and impressions are during the first time I hear the piece. So if you're just looking for company to listen to this song, maybe this is the, not the best place for you, but if you're interested in finding out how I, as a classical musician, react when I first hear Hey You, stay tuned. After this first hearing, I took about four days to listen to the song. Both very detailed, bar by bar, and many, many, many times uninterrupted, dozens of times. To dig deeper into the music score, explore the main ideas, see how the impression of the piece builds in me. So in the second part of this video, I will share with you a very interesting, cool thing that Rogers does um, using modes in this piece. And I will demo a few things on the piano. Hey you. I am ready to listen to this Hey You. And um, I wanted to say that my friend I keep referring to, who's a fan of rock music, the album The Wall by Pink Floyd is one that he talks about over and over again, and he's so enthusiastic about it. I know I need to sit down and listen to the album start to finish sometime to get a really, to get an idea because he says that each piece builds on the next and tells a sort of a story or builds on some ideas. So I know that I'm taking this out of context and probably I will miss some things because of that, but I have to start somewhere. So I'm starting with Hey You and um, let's see how it goes. I like the guitar. Okay. It's a very atmospheric, expressive bass sound that enters there. This really sets a mood, I can feel it. Okay, so, um, hey you, let's go on. I put the lyrics beside my screen here so I can see them. The cold, getting lonely, getting old, can you feel me? Hey you, standing in the aisles with itchy feet and fading smiles, can you feel me? Hey you, don't help them to bury the light Don't give in without a fight So this is interesting to me. I, I like this atmospheric um, sound world that's set up here. I enjoy that. The words seem to be searching and grasping and kind of trying to make contact with somebody. It, I really get that feeling. Hey you, out there on your own, sitting naked by the phone. I'm starting to me? sound more desperate. to call out would you touch me hey you would you help me to carry the stone open your heart I'm coming 
coming home. Okay. Um, I don't understand with this line, would you help me to carry the stone? Maybe it comes from something earlier in the album or, or uh, maybe, I'm not sure. Or is it just some poetic reference? I mean, I can, I can, I'm seeing that these lyrics are very, I guess I would say artistic, poetic, you know, they're not, they're not in your face. Um, it's not just giving you a cut and dried set of ideas. It's kind of letting you build this world in your mind and you can take them one way or the other sometimes. I'm not sure I understand what this help me to carry the stone is referring to. Uh, I'm going to back up just a few seconds because I heard something really sort of menacing sounding coming in. Open your heart. I'm coming home. It's intense. It it's it started out sounding kind of like I don't know jet engines, airplane engines, and then it turned into this other kind of sound, and then it started sounding more like a scream. It's it's transitioning so fast. Um, anyway, I'm going to keep going. enjoying this. It's not the kind of music I'm used to hearing, but but it sounds very rich and it sounds like there are lots of emotions and musical ideas to dig into. This is my first hearing, so I'm a little bit disoriented and not sure what's coming next, but I guess I'll be listening to this piece several times before I do the second half. Interesting transition there. Okay. The wall was too high as you can see. No matter how he tried, he could not break free. And the ones they into his brain. Okay. Uh I was just thinking, before that last line, I was thinking how suddenly this, this section is more like a commentary, some onlooker, someone telling this person's story in the third person, like after the event happened. And it was so interesting the way the voices kind of changed to be this commenter's voice. It sounds like they've taken this idea of the worms ate into his brain and we're looking at a corpse that has flies buzzing around it and maggots in it. Okay, so now we're back to the first person. It's like we had this glimpse into the future and now we're back watching what's, how is this ending? Sounding more desperate. Hey you, out there beyond the wall, breaking bottles in the hall. Can you help me? Hey you, don't tell me 
interesting the way each time this hey you is comes it's he's bringing it up a pitch or he's he's raising the voice differently it's like he's building this sort of um picture of increasing desperateness and and panic and and um just kind of the last last graspings the last cry for help Okay, so this, I know this comes from the album called The Wall, and I, I haven't really understood what of that is, but it seems like there is this wall that is keeping this person away from who he's calling out to. And at the end he says, don't let, don't tell me there's no hope at all. Together we stand, divided we fall. It's like he's saying that if we can make contact, if we can get together, we can, we can actually maybe get out of this and, and s survive. But divided, there's this dividing wall. And with that division, we fall. And then it just has this echoing, like he's falling into this bottomless abyss. That's how it ends. I'm going to have to listen to this a few more times, but this is a really fascinating piece to me. The way all of these um, elements are really working together. And I can sense already that they're working together. I don't really comprehend the whole thing, but I can feel that it is profound and deep. And um, there's a lot to discover here. So I'll be back after I've spent some time with it. I've taken a few days to listen to this song, read about it, learn some more about Pink Floyd and see what, how quickly I can kind of um, get a picture of the context and content and um, everything surrounding it. I'm sure I have a lot more to discover, but here I am with what I've, how far I've gotten to this point. So I understand that Hey You is part of a double album called The Wall. I'm sure all of you know that already. And it's not only the biggest selling album in their catalog, but also it is the third best sell selling album of all time in America. I learned that this album is a complete story with a beginning, a middle, an end, and people kind of call it a, a rock opera. I didn't even know that something like that existed. It was released in 1979. And then the band went on tour for the next two years promoting it. And then the year after that, in 1982, they released a movie with the same title. After listening to this song, I feel like I have to listen to the whole album and I need to watch the movie as well. I found out that the, this concept of the wall um, grew out of an incident which happened in 1977 um, during a concert in Montreal. I guess there was an unruly fan trying to climb the stage and Waters spots him and spits in his face. Years later, like in 2012, when asked about the truth of it, Waters said, quote, it is to my eternal shame. But that incident made him think about this idea of building a wall between the stage and the audience, and later on, he expanded the concept, applying it to his relationship with society as a whole. Of course, you probably all already know this as well, but I learned that this album is a sort of autobiography, um, going through Waters' feelings of abandonment caused by the death of his father in World War II, the trauma he experienced in his dealings with authority figures throughout his childhood. Um, anyway, then in this album, along comes Hey You, which Waters said in an interview 
that it's about the breakup of his first marriage and all the misery and pain and being out on the road when the woman declares over the phone that she's fallen in love with somebody else. In the same interview, he said, the song is also partly an attempt to make connections with other people, to say that maybe if we act in consort, some of the bad feelings will go away. In community, there's comfort. The line, hey you, out there beyond the wall, breaking bottles in the hall, um, is an exhortation to come closer to where I live, that's water speaking, so we can help each other. That's a really complex set of ideas to convey in a piece of music. As I listened to the song over and over the last few days, uninterrupted, mind you, I gradually became aware of a strange, vague feeling that it was reminding me of some other song. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where something rings a bell, but you can't quite place it. Especially there is one specific point. Every time I heard it, this feeling came very strong for a few seconds. But it took a couple of days to, for me to figure out what was going on because that moment was quite brief and then other thoughts and ideas and stuff would come in my mind and by the end of the song I had forgotten to check it out. You might be surprised, but it was the line and the worms ate into his brain. But it wasn't those words which was making me recollect something. It was the rhythm of the words and the shape of the melody there. I kept feeling that I had heard that same line somewhere else. Well, of course, such a simple phrase um, can easily be found in any dozens of pieces, both classical and folk, and I'm sure rock and any other genre. It's, it's not a particularly original little string of notes, but still it was sending me somewhere specific to some other piece. So, when I finally started paying attention, I, I began sifting through what was happening and, and where is this sending me in my memory? And then suddenly it came to me. There's this song called The, the Green Fields of France. And um, if you've never heard it, you should check it out, although it's a very famous song. I'll include a link here and you can check it out yourself. As you listen to it, you might notice that rhythmically in The Green Fields of France, the rhythm of the words is very, the speech rhythm is very similar to the way the line and the worms ate into his brain sounds. And then at the end of the song, Green Fields of France, there's this line that it's just the end of a little phrase. Did, did the pipes play the flowers of the forest and it goes the flowers of the forest um of the forest the melody is almost identical in shape to what is being sung when he sings and the worms ate into his brain it's a weird connection and of course hey you is far more sophisticated a piece of music but it fascinates me that this particular song, The Green Fields of France, which talks about the tragedy of lives lost in war, is what my mind cross-referenced, especially since I hadn't yet done any of the reading behind the history of the song and, and um, what Waters had had in mind as far as his father's death in the war and, and his feelings of abandonment coming from that loss being such an, a feature in the wall. I'm sure everyone has their own favorite moment in this song. It's one that's rich enough to give many different favorite moments. And you don't have to agree with me, but I have to say that for me, the line, I'm coming home, is perhaps the most beautiful, eloquent, and hauntingly heartbreaking moment in the whole song. Especially with the way the bomber plane flies over immediately afterwards. It's so loaded with layers of emotions and saturated with meanings, meanings, plural. One of the marks of a real artist is the ability to craft something incredibly profound out of simple, basic material. An artist doesn't require elaborate techniques and fancy frills to communicate his soul. And when I come face to face with such a work of art, I feel 
a little bit hesitant to dissect it in a, into technical elements because, well, I could give you a dozen of reasons. On the other hand, seeing what the material is with which a master works can give us another kind of appreciation for what he has accomplished. And we can learn things by it too. And the experience itself can be very beautiful. So what does Roger Waters do? He goes back a long, long way to ancient and medieval music systems using something that we call modes. These modes go all the way back to the Greeks and continue through the Middle Ages. It's what, it's what all the medieval sacred church music was made of. And then as Western art music developed a more complex harmonic approach, a lot of these modes fell out of use for a few centuries, and we mostly stuck with what we call major and minor scales for quite a long time. But things always seem to circle back around, and by the 20th century, these various modes were solidly back in use to some extent. Although I don't think we'll ever have a whole music system dependent entirely upon modes ever again. But let me show you at the piano what I'm talking about. What you've probably heard major and minor referred to is the way a series of notes sounds, and we use those no notes to build a piece of music. So a major scale sounds like this. Okay, it has a very distinctive sound. I can start it anywhere on the keys and make it sound with that same quality. A minor scale, a bit more complicated, but it has a sort of different quality to it. And I can start on the same note and I can play a minor scale. Or this is a slightly different scale. And there's even another minor scale, which is kind of a mode. But all of that is to say, that's what our classic Western ears were so immersed in for so many centuries. But before that whole, whole system really established itself, we had what were called modes. Modes are kind of like scales in a way, but we call them modes because that's just the term that has been used for so long, and it helps to distinguish the systems that we have for harmony and, and um, building in those different sound worlds is basically what they are. In a major scale, as we're going up, and if I stop here, you have everything in you screaming out to hear this. If I go, you're not prepared to hear something like this. It doesn't sound wrong once I arrive, but it just, it's not what's pulling you. Modes don't pull in the same way. So we have a different way of giving ourselves a sense of location and identity in that sound world. And we do that by making one note be home. And we visit it often and everything always returns home. So if I'm playing in one of these modes, let's say I choose this same note to be home. And let's say that I'm playing I'm always returning to home, right? I can go and I come back home. That's how we center ourselves in these modes. There are many different modes and I don't want to bore you with a whole bunch of technical information that's not relevant. But this particular piece, Roger Waters uses one mode specifically and another one also he kind of mixes in there. The first mode we kind of face is what we call the Phrygian mode. And it, it's named after this ancient Greek um, region called Phrygia. Then the other mode is one called the Aeolian mode. So, he uses them both. Think of them as sound worlds. He centers them both on the same note for home. 
And so we don't really feel a drastic shift when he goes from one to the other in the song. We feel like this is always home. But that's what he's using instead of the, the major scale that has this pull back home. Roger Waters is using these modes. And not only that, he's limiting himself to just a very few notes. The first half of the song, of, of the verse, uses only the home note, two notes on this side, and one note on this side. So in addition to home, we only have three other pitches being used. And you can hear it starting, starting out, hey you, Now you hear him visiting this home note right here, but he's not settling on it yet. Um, and it goes on. So, so simple. Then he broadens out a little bit because as a good composer, he knows that we need some variety, some contrast, and it's time for that. So the next thing that happens, still in the same mode, he just moves a little bit higher um, in this sound world. It shifts things a bit, and um, here's what happens. come back and settle on home. All the way through the verse, he managed to give us a sense of location and identity without actually placing us home to rest, to settle. It's genius. And um, when you pair that with his use of instruments and his voice and all the different things, it sets up this incredibly rich, colorful, um, expressive piece of music that you feel like you could explore forever. And all he's using are just these few little notes. So of course this song is written in, in a verse format, where you have a verse, and then another verse, and then there's the little space where the guitar does its special solo moment, and then you have yet a third verse. And each one of these verses use pretty much the same melody, the same set of notes. But when we get to the second verse, it becomes very special. In addition to all the emotions that the lyrics and the music together are weaving us into, this fact that we never arrive at home for the entire verse adds yet another layer of kind of unspoken poignancy when we get to that special little moment when he sings I'm coming home and the word home in the verse itself is exactly the home note of the song the only time in that whole verse that we enter and settle here I could go on about so many things in this song from the way the first bass notes enter and speak so expressively at the opening, the way the music increases in pain and desperation as the song progresses, the ex and, and the incredible experience where the worms ate into his brain and we feel at first as if we're viewing a corpse full of maggots with flies buzzing around, but then he, with simple, subtle shifts in the coloring and timbre of of the music, musical sounds there. There's a sensation of being transitioned inside the person's head. And it's so palpable. We end up feeling as if we are viewing his inner mind. It's, it's an incredibly psychological moment. And it's as if the music has transported us right through to the other side of this wall so that we're able to see and feel what is actually going on on the other side. 
And of course, then the way the music carries us along in the final build up and we become so hopeful as we hear the last phrases, the last phrase where it says, um, together we stand. Only to be stunned and shocked as we suddenly find ourselves. Again, the music does this, places us outside of his mind again, unable to reach him as he falls. And we only hear the echo of, of his call fading rapidly at the end. But if I were to go into every detail, it would be hours too long. So I'll stop here. And I hope that gives you some, some interesting things to think about and explore as you listen to this piece. Of course, being just part of a long story, I'm sure that these lines are connected to, are, are a continuation of the whole narrative. But since I never listened to the entire album, I cannot refer to these except in isolation. These lyrics are beautiful. They are a work of art from my perspective. They do stand by themselves, but of course, the way Waters wrote them, uh, they belong to the story that I don't know yet. It makes no sense for me to tell you what I see in them at this point and the way I would interpret them since I don't yet know the whole storyline. It's kind of like trying to understand Beethoven's fifth piano concerto by listening to only the second movement. But the music and the lyrics are blending together perfectly in this song. I don't think the music would stand by itself without the words. And uh, the words wouldn't have the same impact without the music. But this particular marriage of music and words, as it was done by Waters, is truly fine art. Do I like this song? This is the type of song that I do like. Why? Because of its depth, both in musical sensitivity and in philosophical meaning. I love things that make me return again and again and again. You were right. Pink Floyd is a must, and it will definitely come back to this channel again. I am looking forward to your reactions, thoughts, suggestions, and I'll see you again soon here on Virgin Rock.